Blue Sox Nation, long time no talk. This is Tim Best, your PA announcer and your host of the SoxCast. And like I said, long time no talk. That's because we haven't had a SoxCast in a month and a half. Obviously, the home stretch of the season made things pretty busy. And during that time of the year, specifically that part of the season, things really weren't going that well. So, you know, me knowing that sometimes when things are going bad, guys don't want to talk and they just want to focus and right the ship. Hey, got to respect that. But don't want to dwell on the negatives. This is your year in review Sox cast. And for the most part, when all is said and done, the conclusion is that this year, nothing but a positive. The streak of consecutive division titles is over. However, that's the bad news. The good news, as you know, Blue Sox get their first playoff victory and advance in the playoffs for the first time since that magical 2016 season where they went all the way to the PGCBL Championship Series. But before I get to that, let's go all the way back to June. It all started with a wild, come-from-behind win against the Geneva Red Wings to start the year. They were down 5 to nothing and only had one hit going into the seventh inning, but pulled off a ferocious rally, and they came back to win 7-6. to six. Jack Zuffer got the win. Deidre Kale got the game-winning RBIs, and nailing down the save would be David Thurman. And then in the home opener, many of you were there, got some revenge against the Auburn Double Days, beating them by a final a 4-1 to one with another St. Thomas guy. I mentioned Zupper got the win against Geneva on opening night. The home opener, Evan Esch, got the start through five innings, getting the win, five shutout innings, that is, to beat the Auburn Double Days. And that was a bit of a slow build game because the Blue Sox knocked, their, knocked Auburn starter out in an inning in two-thirds after he walked five of the nine hitters he faced. But the Blue Sox couldn't score off of that. But they did put up four, and it was a four to one victory. And throughout that first part of the season, it was a hot start. They started off four and zero, then they lost three in a row, and then on June thirteenth, the streak began. Started with an eight seven win at Watertown, a game in which the Blue Sox nearly blew a four run lead that they took into the bottom of the ninth, and then from there, a win over Geneva. A road win. Actually, uh, before I get, I almost forgot. I thought there was a road win in between there, but they got the rain out. But a walk-off win over the Newark Pilots in which Edwin Tavares hit the walk-off infield hit as part of a two-run bottom of the ninth, erasing a one-run deficit for a one-run victory. And then winning at Auburn, exercising some demons at Falcon Park. And then... That was when they went into dominance mode, shutting out the Watertown Rapids, taking a perfect game into the sixth inning against the Newark Pilots on the road. Then a doubleheader sweep of the defending league champion, Saugerty Stallions, shut them out the first game and the second game. They bases were loaded two outs top of the seventh inning, and there was a ball that was heading towards no man's land. If it dropped, Saugerty takes the lead. Because they were down one. It was going to score two with two outs with the runners going. And not stopping. But Brady Short came up with a huge play. To end it. And keep the win streak alive for now. Then they won on the road at Mohawk Valley. Autism acceptance night. By the way, I'm going on a quick tangent here about autism acceptance night. What a success that was. The jerseys sold incredibly well. The support from the Calverman Center and everyone in attendance was phenomenal. As, as it turns out, we raised well over $3,000 for our first annual Autism Acceptance Night. So Blue Sox Nation, tip of the cap to you for that. Now, and in that game, it was all Sox. Joe Maselli started the game and threw three scoreless innings. And then Jacob Retchen came in and threw Five more scoreless innings. They were up 8-0. They went 8-4 as, at that point, just for laughs, Chris Fernandez came on to pitch in the ninth and was responsible for the four runs that 
Elmira scored. They cut the deficit in half, but obviously too little, too late. And that made it 10 in a row. Then 11 at Auburn, had a couple days off, beat Auburn again at home. And that was a dominant 7-1 to win. And more on that 7-1 to recurring theme a little bit later. Don't want to spoil anything. And then that was 12. And that was 12. And then going for the record for not only the PGCBL, but the Blue Sox franchise record as well. They did it with a dominant sweep of, of the Boonville Baseball Club in a double header, winning 9 to 2 in game 1 and then 10 nothing via mercy rule in game 2. So at that point in the year, the Sox are 18 and 3. And they, at that point, owning the best record in the PGCBL. The streak ended the next night, June 30th, with a with an ugly loss at Watertown. They lost 16 to 6. And then July 1st was when things started to take a turn for the worst. Because in a doubleheader against Amsterdam, in the first game, Blue Sox lose not one, but two players on the same play as left fielder Brandon Durand and center fielder Easton Brenner collided with each other. Durand got knocked out for the year with a shoulder injury, Brenner with a wrist fracture. And again, we just want to wish uh, Brandon and Easton just the best in their recoveries. I'm, I assume they're going swimmingly, an adjective I personally like to use. Or Is that an adverb? Yeah, that's an adverb at that point. But, again, want to continue to wish him well in their recovery process. And what was the importance? On the stat sheet, doesn't really seem like much. But Brandon Duran was a guy who, as, as a recent high school grad, brought a lot of energy. Easton Brenner, one of the most positive, upbeat guys in the clubhouse. The ultimate clubhouse guy, if you ask me. You lose the ultimate clubhouse guy, morale goes down. But they shook it off right after that. You know, they got shut out. Uh, they got scored 6-1 to one in the doubleheader. 3-1 loss, 3 nothing loss. Then they go to Boonville. They shake it off and, I guess, take out their anger on Boonville. They went 14-1. to one. And then in a thriller against Mohawk Valley, the first time they came to Murnane, the Sox came back and beat them 4-3. to three. And then after the 4th of July was when things started to tank a little bit. I mean, I, I can't mince my words on that. Just being 100% honest. You know, they split a, you know, they tied, as stupid as it sounds, they tied the opening game of a doubleheader in Saugerties and they got whacked 11-1 to in game two. And then you could tell things weren't great when they lost to the worst team in the league, the Glens Falls Dragons, the following night. And by the way, that was the last time Glens Falls would win the whole season. And it, it, the struggle was just continue and continue. But I don't want to like, you know, like, it's like, oh, coincidence, I think not. But the moment where things kind of took a turn for the better was July 16th against the Jamestown Tarp Skunks at Murnane. Robbie Young's jersey retirement ceremony slash Hall of Fame induction. Having a legend like Robbie in the house. He was the captain of the 2019 West Division regular season championship team and a member of the West Division championship team back in 16 when he was a, still a youngin, not the veteran captain that he was three years later. But having them there, big morale boost. And and this was after Ryan Enos, you know, played his final game of the year with Utica before heading to the Cape League uh, to play with the Born Braves, where he just won himself a championship. So, and Rhino, if this is it for him, a tremendous career. As of right now, a 312 career average, one hit away from 100, which is a bummer that he couldn't get in his final game. He was two away. He got an infield hit in the middle of the game, and it was about 
five feet away, five, six feet away from at least the ball hitting the wall, maybe even clearing the wall for hit number 100 in the ninth inning of that game, his final game, July 14th against the Watertown Rapids. More, more on Rhino in just a little bit. But that game against the Tarp Skunks, a bit of a turning point as the Sox won that game 5-1. to one. And then from there, things slowly but surely improved. They continued to protect home field at Murnane. They beat Auburn yet again, going undefeated against the Double Days at home. In the regular season, that is. Then, a tough loss against the Diamond Dogs, 11-2. to two. And then pick the park night. Blue Sox Nation, you showed out again. And the guys really, you know, turned it on for you guys. Your energy proved a big difference. And they went down early. I think they went down 3 nothing right off the bat. Brandon Peterson struggled. And then what did Utica do? I don't know. We just scored 11 unanswered. And we win running away 11-3. to Okay, that's progress. And then beat Watertown at home to still maintain as Batavia slid a little bit. Still kept themselves in the conversation with for a division title with a dominant 11-1 win over Watertown via Mercy Rule. And then where th- the skid happened again, going to Watertown, they trailed big. I think they were down a couple. They were down a couple runs going into the eighth inning. They were down one going into the ninth. They tie it in the ninth. Tied at five, and then some missed opportunities uh, in the 10th with that courtesy runner rule at second base. Utica can't capitalize. Watertown does. They win it walk-off style, six to five, and then from there, just got tougher. Lose the Diamond Dogs in the home finale. Amsterdam dominates at Shuttleworth Park the following night, and then end the regular season, they split a doubleheader in Boonville. So they ultimately, they lose the division title to the Muck Dogs, end up as the two seed, and go ahead in the playoffs, not really trending in the right direction. But when it comes to one game, doesn't matter what happened in the week before or even the two weeks before. When it comes down to one game, all you got to do is just play better than the other team and you're moving on. And that's what happened on Sunday, July 31st. And didn't start off that way either. Auburn took a one nothing lead in the third. We got a lot of hits early off of starter Evan Esch. But Utica stayed the course. And in the bottom of the fourth, after an Edwin Tavares walk, the diaper dandy, to quote Dick Vitale, Lucas Schramm heading to Kentucky. And he hit a ball that looked like it was heading on its way to Lexington. A two-run bomb to Almost dead center is more left of center. That two-run homer gave Utica the lead, and they would not look back. The Sox end up winning 7-1 to one to move on to the West Division final against the Batavia Muck Dogs. And mentally and physically exhausted, the Blue Sox just weren't able to have enough to go into Batavia in a hostile environment, blackout crowd. And... The Muck Dogs end up winning six to nothing with a backbreaking moment being a three run home run in the fourth inning that turned a one nothing game into a four nothing game. And obviously the deficit becomes a little more insurmountable from one run, which relatively easy to get compared to four. Because let's be real, it's hard to homer in this league unless you're in a very hitter friendly park. And it just, it wasn't going to happen on one swing of the bat. So Utica ends up falling in the West Division final again to the Batavia Muck Dogs, who end up falling to Amsterdam in three games. Uh, They took it to a third game in that PGCBL Championship Series, but Amsterdam proved to be too powerful. So Utica, in the regular season, I would still say a a very, very good campaign as they end up winning 30 games. Actually, no, I was wrong. They win, they go 29, 17, and 1. 
you know, I may be wrong, but they still had, simply put, a tremendous season and one that most certainly, I mean, given how they started, they absolutely, you know, they disappointed at the end, but given the injuries and the departure of Ryan Enos, the glue in the clubhouse as a captain. And the funny thing is, Sox won without Dewey Roden in the playoffs against the Auburn Double Days. But speaking of Dewey, he had a historic season. While he did taper off in July, he still hit well over 300 and earned himself all PGCBL first team honors and rose up the ranks in Blue Sox franchise history this season. He is now fourth all time in hits, fourth all time in games played, and in, now in the top five in a vast majority of categories. And Ryan Enos moved into third all time in the vast majority of categories too, and his 312 average for his career now is second all time amongst players who played multiple years here in Utica. Speaking of Rhino, he was an all PGCBL second team selection, as were catcher Will King. And Will King had a tremendous campaign, hitting almost 350 with 12 runs batted in and 23 games played. He came in like right after Father's Day, and he just came in and just raked. And the we heard a lot about the power, which is, you wouldn't expect it out of a kid who, you know, definitely under six feet tall, but his swing and what he's packing with the guns, he definitely provided big power in the middle of the order, or even the top of the order, because he would oftentimes hit in the two hole. And then on the pitcher side, Evan Esch, all PGCBL second team, but a guy that really surprised me as a first teamer was Alex Canino, shortest player on the team at five foot six, but everyone loves him. Everyone calls him Big Al. He finishes the season with a 1.51 ERA. A lot of people tend to forget because I think more people tend to focus on Evan Esch and even Jack Zupper, who was a PGCBL West Division All Star selection halfway through the year. But Alex Canino really came on late in that funky. Submarine-like delivery definitely played a big role in him earning first-team honors in the all-PGCBL squad. I mean, in a 1.51 ERA, that's pretty darn good in a league where there's a lot of good hitting. And Alex Canino ain't a D1 arm. He's out of Limestone University. You know, they're, they're still a very good D2. They ain't D1, and there's a lot of good hitting across this league. I mean, there was a game where Amsterdam put up 22. And there was actually a game Watertown and Boonville played in July where there were 51 runs combined. 26-25 was the final. I wish I was making that up, but I'm not. Summer college baseball, what can we say? So, what are my final thoughts on the season? Well, a lot of highs, a lot of lows, but this was historic in a lot of ways. I mean, the streak. When you think of 2022, forget about July. Like, with the injuries, you can understand why the second half went the way that it did. But if there's one thing to take away from this, it's the streak. Something that was a historic benchmark. For not just the Blue Sox franchise, but the PGCBL. They set the record with 12 and then went all the way to 14. And were 18-3 and three at one point. And during that 14-game streak, they were outscoring opponents 103-39. to 39. Think about that for a second. They were giving up less than three runs a game during this 14-game win streak. How many runs did they average? Try, try about seven and a half. It's pretty darn good. And you still, I mean, Rhino, if, if he played the full season here in the U, he's unanimous first team, all PGCBL. Actually, now I think about it, 
Had some stiff competition with Gage Miller. I will give him that from Amsterdam. But you give Rhino a little more time, he was going to keep on moving up. And he was probably going to move into second all time in games played because he was only like 11 behind Luis De Leon, former teammate of his for a couple of years. So, enough, you know, we can focus on the future because, I mean, we, we got a long, long, long way to go before we even get in the mindset of looking ahead to 2023. So, as we look back and celebrate 2022, Obviously, the first thing to think about is the streak. And it takes a special group of guys to do that. And the funny thing is, during that streak, new guys came into the fold, like Will King and Brandon Duran. And you know, like, even though, like, while they were still in their hot phase, Carson Applegate came in. And Carson Applegate was another guy that really, really surprised out of the gates. He was red hot. And then he proved to be a big difference maker. He got the first hit for Utica in the playoff game against the Auburn Double Days. And, you know, he had quite the start to the season. And he actually had a game where, you know, he had four hits against Mohawk Valley. And and I think two or three doubles. uh, Two doubles, two singles, I believe. I may be wrong, but I know he got at least two doubles in that game as part of a 4-3 victory. But just across the board, the talent was absolutely there, and the local guys, Rhino and Dewey, having monster years to pace this group. That makes it even more special because they wanted to make their third and potentially final year count, and they most certainly did that. That much, you cannot deny. And again, like during the streak, you know, there were times early on where it looked like it was going to end, especially that home game against Newark where they were down a run going into the bottom of the ninth. Me personally, though, I saw Drake Sizemore come back after them. I'm like, we got this. And you heard me talk about it when I had Edwin Tavares and Chris Fernandez on to talk about that. And while that streak was still happening and unraveling in real time. You know, I've been with this club for eight years. The streak may have been the most special thing I've ever been a part of. And that includes going to the PGCBL Championship Series way back in 2016. But in a way, it's kind of like Moneyball. You know, we have we have the streak, and then things kind of fizzled out. But when it comes to the group of guys that were here, especially with how fun they were, guys like Easton Brenner, the bullpen was electric early in the year with, you know, Itai and Logan Wenzel, Garrick Spradlin, Big Al, like, those guys bringing in a couch, <laughs> bringing in the couch all the way to the bullpen and the props they would use for the pumping up, like a traffic cone. It was a loose, electric group of guys. They made coming to the ballpark fun, and they made the games fun for me and everyone in attendance. And I'm sure, I, I, I know I can attest to it. I'm sure every one of you listening and tuning in can too. So... Obviously, do we want to win a championship for you guys? Absolutely, 100%. But given our playoff woes the last couple of years, this was a step in the right direction. And we will come back bigger, better, and stronger for 2023. And I know that to be true, especially when you got Doug Gillette, the man, the myth, the legend himself, as the manager. So, that is your season in review, SoxCast. Thanks for tuning in throughout the season, and obviously, you know, apologize for the month and a half hiatus. Obviously, I get busy, season gets busy, I get sidetracked, and, you know, things happen. But, to all of you who came to the ballpark all year, and even listening in on Mixler, to hear Jack Angelucci, Jack Gordon, Um, and Gabe Howe, whenever he filled in. Thank you so much. We always appreciate your support year in and year out. Look forward to seeing you in in the 2023 season, but stay tuned during the offseason. A lot more SoxCast content coming with interviews with guys that really made their mark here in the U this summer. 
Thanks for tuning in. Catch you next time.